a lot of people are reluctant to share their stories, but when they see a positive reaction or they have someone come up to them and say, I'm going through the same thing you're going through, it inspires other people to come out. And since we started This Is My Brave, I think it was 2015 or 14 when the first show was, they've just blown up. They are like, they've got like 50 shows all over the U.S. And um, I don't know the exact number, but probably, they've probably done around 50 shows and they've done New York, LA, they've done like Ohio, they've done all over the US. And every show has about 20 people telling their own story in their own words. And they do it through music, they do it through uh, poetry, they do it through testimony. And when you go to these shows, there's not a dry eye in the place because everybody can relate to these impassionate people coming out and telling their mental health journeys. So the documentary was made about a year ago. Um, I think it was like a year and a half. A year or and a, okay, yeah, it was posted about a, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, have there been um, any updates in terms of a, any updates or things that just didn't make it into the doc, documentary? Things that um, like, there you know, were interviews alive. with some of my friends, including other musicians, and for brevity, they were left and content like the flow of the documentary, they left them out, but you can watch them online. If you wanna see some of my friends talk about their experiences with when I was manic or with my music. Um, also, um, since then, I w when the documentary was filmed, I wanted to attend graduate school. And since then I've started graduate school. I'm in my third year, a four year program for a master's of social work. So I'm going to VCU, which I know is not Virginia Tech, but well, they're all right. <laughs> it's not UVA either. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm in my third year of a four-year program, and it's challenging, but it's really pushing me to kind of brush up on the clinical clinical aspect of mental health. And I had an internship at a substance abuse facility because I come from the mental health world, where I've been working for eight years, and um, there is some overlap with dual diagnosis but I got to have a peek into the world of substance abuse and with the opioid epidemic and everything. Mm -hmm. I got to meet people who were undergoing treatment and hear their stories and um, learn about that world too. Okay. I'm going off script a little bit because, okay. because this, is, um, this, this has sparked something. What can you, has it been, what's the experience been like um, learning about something that you live that you that's part of your life both in terms of your experience and the work that you do but then um, engaging it in an academic grad school kind of it's space. It's definitely that, been challenging because um, I'm, I'm not somebody who had ever really taken a liking to school. I kind of, I went to art school and if anyone here has been to art school, it's not very difficult. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think my longest thesis was like a page and a half. So, you know, I had to learn how to cite sources and APA style and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's interesting to me because I'm learning what a clinician does. And I'm around clinicians for like eight years. I've been working, I've been like the only peer on my team for a while and I'm around clinicians all the while. So I have a lot of the jargon and a lot of the words that they say and I know a lot of the routines and things that they do. But now I'm brushing up on the actual nuts and bolts of um, like how to diagnose people and learning about other illnesses that I don't suffer from. So I know plenty about bipolar mm -hmm. and I know a lot about schizophrenia just by working with the schizophrenic community. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm learning about other, other di like borderline or oppositional defiance disorder. I'm learning about all these other um, disorders that, and, you know, post-traumatic stress. So I'm learning about all these other things in a way that will equip me if I want to go into a clinical role, I can do that. Documentary, the documentary provides some information. For instance, it, it talks about how 5.7 million American adults are affected by bipolar, how many people don't receive the, um, the, the treatment they, they, they need. Um, 
Is there anything additional that to kind of the information that's provided surrounding whether it's bipolar disorder or it's mental illness generally? That, well, that I think like is mental illness in general is like a continuum or a spectrum. And it's not you're either mentally ill or you're not. It's a spectrum of wellness. And you could, I mean, most of the people in this room, I'm assuming, are on the well side of this spectrum. I, I don't know your stories. There might be some people who are. But it's anybody can go anywhere on the spectrum at any point in their life. Um, the statistics are actually one in five have some sort of experience with mental illness in their life somewhere on the spectrum. And as far as being seriously mentally ill like I was, that's one in 25. So that's a little rarer than one in five, but chances are you probably know somebody or you've been affected or you have a family member or somebody you've heard about who's in the one in five on the spectrum, if not you, yourself going through it. And then um, one in 25, that's four out of 100 people with the serious mental illness. And when you see mental illness talked about on the news, it's sensationalized. Of course, with the history of everything that happened here, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the way the news can take a story and run with it. But the average person with mental illness is more, li more likely to live in a group home, like have a job part-time bagging groceries, go to a treatment center, take medication. The, the statistics say it's more likely that people with mental illness um, are victims of violence than perpetrators of violence. So um, I know sometimes the media portrays us as villains or you watch a cop show and there's a mentally ill Hannibal Lecter type character. But I think um, people have been making progress and moving the needle on the conversation. I think more people are coming out like Demi Lovato came out about her mental health issues and raise awareness. Um, uh, Kanye West has talked a little bit about it. I don't know where he's, his journey taking him right now, but um, he's raised some awareness about mental health. And I think it's a dialogue that maybe 10 years ago we weren't having in the way we're having it now. Like movies like Silver Linings Playbook was a big hit and that had mentally ill, uh, people with mental illness as the main characters. Great, great. Toward, towards the end of the documentary, you talk about some of the work that you've been doing with local police forces. Um, could you just give us an overview of that and also share what a certified peer recovery specialist is? Sure. Um, well, I've been a certified peer. Uh, basically, I was pushing shopping carts at Home Depot. That was my job. And my case manager said, I want you to be a peer. You can do this. And I had no idea what a peer even was. And for those who don't know, um, a peer specialist is somebody who has lived mental health experience and they work alongside clinicians in the medical model, but they aren't of the medical model. And the medical model is the typical um, continuum of services that people who have mental health go, like a doctor, a psychiatrist, a caseworker, a therapist, that's the medical model. So peers, um, when I started there, maybe five peers in Fairfax County, and now there's over 20, I think. Um, but I'm somebody who, somebody comes in in a crisis or, uh, I was on a team called Jail Diversion and it's a program that diverts people who are mentally ill, who get in trouble with the law. A lot of times it's loitering, trespassing, um, just like a simple misdemeanor type of crime, nonviolent, and they get diverted from going to jail into going to treatment services so that Hopefully they won't have anything on their record. Um, I used to get services from the jail diversion team and my case manager is the one who approached me and said, I think you could be a peer. I think you could do this. I think you'd be really good at it. So I was pushing shopping carts. I had nothing to lose. I was like, sure, let me try it out. And I kind of had to invent my job in many ways. And many things that are cool about my job is that um, it's similar to what case managers do, but I don't do a lot of the work the heavy lift, I write clinical notes, but they aren't in the same capacity as case managers. But I also get to do things that are outside the box. So one of the terms we use is we meet people where they're at. So if you have a mental illness and um, you sit in your basement all day, I'll come to your basement and I'll talk with you and I don't force you to do anything. I don't say, hey, you need to take meds. 
you need to go outside. I just meet you where you're at. I get to know you. If you feel comfortable talking, I'll talk to you. If you're not comfortable talking, I'll just leave and come back another time. I had a client who lived in the woods and I would go visit him in the woods. So we meet the clients where they're at and we don't force anything on them. We're just sort of a, somebody they can talk to and get to know who has a history that may be similar to theirs. And um, usually when I meet with a client, I don't volunteer my whole story when I first meet with them. I sort of get to know them, try to build a rapport. And then when I tell them, oh, I have a mental illness. Oh, I was in that psych ward. I take medication. Their eyes kind of light up. And they're like, wait, what do you mean? And I tell them a little bit more. And then that's kind of like a hook. And they, the clinician can then come in and help with the other services that we offer. But it sort of forms that bond where like, you get it. You know what it's like to be tasered by the police. You know what it's like to have to take medication or to be in a psych ward and have your whole family think you're crazy. So that's sort of what a peer does. A peer is somebody who listens. That's the primary thing we do. We listen to the people um, we serve. We get to know them. We build that rapport. And then we help navigate them through whatever they want to do with their treatment. Um, if that means take medication, we help them take medication. If they want to diet, uh, we help them diet, whatever their wellness looks like for them. And for me, it's fun because I get to do things like I take clients to movies. I have a group on Fridays uh, once a month where they come and they play video games. I get to play video games with them. I started a chess club. I have several clients I play chess with every week. I have an art therapy class that I run. So I get to do a lot of things that the normal clinicians don't necessarily get to do and I enjoy that aspect of my job as far as the CIT um, it was very difficult for me because of my history with the police when I first started speaking to the police but I believe that it's important that they hear stories like mine because if I can affect if there's 20 cops in a room and I affect one of them and then he goes on he interacts with someone who has mental illness and he gives them better service because of what he heard from my story, I feel that that's a benefit. So I've always felt that that's why I decided to speak with the police when I have a kind of rocky history myself with the police. But I've really come to the point where the chief of police in Fairfax is on a first name basis with me. And he comes to the This Is My Brave shows and he talks to me about mental health and about things he's trying to do policy-wide. Um, I was a stakeholder on the Diversion First program in Fairfax, and that was a program that was trying to ease the burden that the police officers face when they bring somebody in in the mental health crisis to give them quicker services, get them linked up with services. and Because a, a lot of police officers are the first line of defense when it comes to mental health, and they didn't sign up to be case managers or therapists, and they're doing that work. And uh, so a program like Diversion First helps them pass the work on to the people like the case managers who should be doing the work. Um, but it has been at times, it's been a little rocky, I will admit, because um, sometimes you get lost. I've been in recovery for so long, I'm doing so well. I don't want to be like a token person with mental illness who's on a board, who isn't struggling like some of the other people are and also there was an incident in Fairfax County where a person with mental illness named Natasha McKenna um, died in custody she was tasered to death and that is the same building that I used to go in and see clients in the jail and connect them with services and when I heard of that my heart sank and it was hard to do the work to speak to police because you want to get these things across and then someone gets killed while they're in custody and it just it, it's very heartbreaking but um i believe the work's important and i continue to do it because i know sharing my story and talking to the police i can share tips and things i can tell them that'll help the next encounter they have go better the work i think the work is incredibly important and it, it, in some ways, this idea of meeting people where they are reminds me of some things in qualitative research and particularly some of the feminist interventions in qualitative research, this idea of doing research with people instead of on people. So, so uh, a quest, so it's, it's, it's heartening to 
hear that you are doing this kind of kind of work. Is this, you said a little bit that you had to define, kind of create your position and that you've been successful in that. Do you think that this is, is your story or your position unique or do you think that this is a place that different municipalities are recognizing the importance of having people in I think world? when I started, it was more unique. I started in 2009 in November. And like I said, there were only like five peers in, the, in Fairfax who were paid and working full time. And since then, we've kind of, the five peers that I've been working with kind of laid the groundwork and made it for other peers to build on what we've been doing. And um, we've just been getting rave reviews from the police we work with and the staff we work with and the case managers we work with. They see the value in what it is that we do and they advocate for them to hire and train more of us. And we do trainings like once a year where we get more people trained to become peers. But one of the issues with that is you have people who become trained and then if there aren't positions available they don't necessarily get to work so we're trying to make like tracks for them to kind of get jobs but there's only so many jobs out there I'm very fortunate that I'm able to make my living doing this and that I can be out about my mental health uh, challenges and be like an advocate um, because there are a lot of people who take the training and then they don't get a job or um, I'm very fortunate that I work for a county that pays pretty well for the work that I do. Um, yeah. See, does that answer the question? Yeah, completely. Yeah. And and you're you're an advocate in many in many ways. I think you're a good advocate in these kinds of stages as well. Um, I know, or I at least imagine that there are some students out there who are hoping to have careers in law enforcement. What advice would you give to current or future? police officers or other people in law enforcement in terms of Okay. Well, this is some advice I was just giving at the conference across the street. And uh, the way I got tasered was, um, I didn't know this, but whenever a police officer puts somebody into custody in a squad car, it's customary for them to take their hand, put it on the back of your head so your head does not hit the top of the squad car. So I was being taken into custody. They put the hand on top of my head. And I felt they were being overly forceful and touching me and pushing my head. So I resisted more and that escalated the situation. And I learned through the crisis intervention training I did that that's just something they always do. So something as small as that can escalate a situation and make it physical when it doesn't need to be. And another thing, um, I talk about like body language, posture, inflection, tone of voice, um, a lot of police officers are taught to have very authoritative, like sit on the ground, do this, listen to me, you know, give orders. That's sort of how they're taught and trained because they need to make these split second decisions and they need people to comply with what they're saying. And when you have someone with mental illness, that's just going to escalate a situation. If you have somebody barking orders at you and you're delusional, it's, it can escalate a situation very quickly. So I tell them, to be calm, be relaxed. Like I, I know there are situations where they need to be authoritative and take people into custody by force. But if you can make that the, the last resort and just be calm and just realize that you're seeing a person with mental illness, you're seeing them on their worst day. So you're not seeing them on the best day of their life. They're probably at their worst. They're, they might say rude things to you. They might, be out of their minds, speaking gibberish, but you don't know what path they're gonna go on in the future and what they might achieve or what life they have or who their loved ones are. Um, Cause everybody has somebody who cares about them. And um, you, I think you need to see, have empathy and see the humanity of the person you're serving when you have to take them into custody. And I know that can be difficult cause Someone might spit on you or scuffle with you or curse at you, but you're seeing them at their worst and they deserve empathy too. Thank you. How about from the other side of the interaction? And do you have any advice you'd give to people and maybe particularly someone who has mental illness, at least to the extent that they maybe have some control over, over their actions when they are encountering police? Um, this is hard because when you're delusional it's hard to remember like when I was sick the last thing I was thinking about was 
the law and my rights and what I should do or shouldn't do. I was going a million miles per hour and I was thinking about, you know, the universe and God and all these weird theories I have. But um, I was actually talking to you about this last night. Um, I got pulled over two weeks ago for driving a little fast. And I did some research after I got pulled over because um, the cop was asking me these strange questions that they usually don't ask during a regular traffic stop. He was like, have you been violent? Do you smoke marijuana? And then he said, do you mind if a canine unit searches your car? And I parked up and I was like, I thought this was just a regular traffic stop. Why are we having a canine unit search my car? I don't have any drugs or anything in the car, but I didn't want to go through with that. So I said, I did not consent to a search. Um, then he asked me again, he asked me the same question again. I said, you can write me a speeding ticket, but I do not consent to a search. So I went home and I watched some videos on, and I did some research about, um, what to do if you do get pulled over. And, um, I actually have a handout here with, I can pass it around if people want to look at it. It's, um, I have two websites. One of them is flexyourrights.org. And eventually the cop let me go and he didn't write me a ticket or anything. And I think it was because I told him I did not consent to a search. But if you don't know your rights, it's easy for them to take advantage of um, your rights. The other one is upagainstthelaw.org. And these are some uh, questions to use with law enforcement, like am I being detained? Do you have a warrant? What crime am I committing? I do not consent to this search. I'm going to remain silent. I want a lawyer. And then there's a interesting graphic about stop snitching on yourself. So I'll pass these around if you guys want to look at them. But I would advise anybody, well, I would advise everybody, not just people with mental illness, to be aware of your rights and what police can and cannot do. And I don't mean this to be antagonistic towards police officers, but um, – you know, he was asking these weird questions. It was just a routine traffic stop. And if if I had played it differently, he might have brought a dog out and he wouldn't have found anything, but it would have been a waste of time and just something I didn't want to go through. It would have, I mean, it can be humiliating to have a dog and they can go through your car and rearrange your stuff, throw it on the ground. They have the right to do that. So um, it's important to know your rights so if, if they are being violated, at least you can get a lawyer who can say, hey, look, this happened or this happened. He didn't consent to a search. You searched anyway. So I think it's important um, for the other side of the coin to know um, your rights and know you don't have to speak anything and you can remain silent. You can request a lawyer. So this is the basic rights. So Great. Thank you. Um, for our last couple of questions, I want to turn to hip hop and to your music. And then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, can just can you briefly share your background as a hip hop artist? Oh man, I've <laughs> I've been obsessed with hip hop since I was a little kid, and I used to buy cassettes. And my parents would only let me buy the parental advisory cassettes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had friends who would dub like N.W.A. and give that to me, and I would listen to the harder stuff. But I've always it's something about the poetry and the words and the rhythm. Um, so I've been making music since, a, and like the sixth grade is when I wrote my first rap and I grew up with other people who wanted to be rappers and they've all become rappers. And we, it's something we do regardless of whether we have a large following or a small following. And, um, I mentioned in the documentary, my collaboration I did with an artist named the witch doctor. From and, the dungeon family. Yeah. From the dungeon family. Yeah. Any hip hop heads know him. Uh, and you don't know the Dungeon Family, Outcast. You probably know Outcast. They're a part of the Dungeon Family. And the Witch Doctor's on like three Outcast albums. But um, he was like a legend in my mind because he came out with an album um, called A SWAT Healing Ritual in 98. There's only one. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, to me, it was an introduction to music as a healing. He has a skit on the album where he talks about how words have meaning and they have rhythm and they have their own language and words are basically spells and when you speak you're weaving spells and these stories that you're telling yourself and telling others are like spells that are being weaved and he talks about how music can heal people and it can heal your soul so um when i was in the hospital all i did was listen to music and that, 
I took it literally. And there were points in my life where I believed in the witch doctor as like a literal witch doctor. <laughs> so um, I was on MySpace. And anyone who's of a certain age remembers MySpace was the original fa before Facebook, but it was more music oriented. And I found him on MySpace and he's not like a big celebrity or anything, but he is to me. And I sent him a message like, I want to do a song with you. He called my phone from his own number in like five minutes and was like, let's make a song. And it was just um, amazing. And the song that we made is called Just Like You. And he came out with another album in 2007. And our song made that album. It was put out by William Street Records. Uh, yeah, through the Cartoon Network. So I went from being a fan to being on his second album that was released nationwide. So when it came out, I went and bought like 20 copies of it. And the cashier looked at me weird, like, why is this guy buying 20 copies of the same album? But um, that's probably the biggest reach that my music has ever um, gotten. And um, that was a time when I was still going in and out of the mental hospital um, when that album came out. But um, since 2005, I've been releasing publicly the stuff. I've been making stuff since like 97. I would just share it with my friends or whatever. But since 2005, I've been releasing online and through websites where you can buy CDs. I know people don't buy CDs anymore, but I usually make at least one album a year, sometimes more, because I'm obsessed with music and rap music. And if no one else listens to it, I listen to it. And I always joke that I have more albums than I have fans. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the people who are fans of my music love my music and they come up to me and they're like, you know, this really helped me through a hard time. I was dealing with the same thing. You know, I really liked what you were doing. So um, it's, it's, an obs it's like a compulsion or an obsession I have where I, if I have free time, I mean, I'm in grad school now, so it's hurting me because I can't make the music I want to make. But if I have free time, I make music. That's kind of my therapy session, you know. And I listen to it, and it's like a spell that I'm listening to. And it helps me out, and it encourages me and um sometimes i'm not doing too well and i'll rap about my ideals and by listening to myself rap about my ideals it helped me actualize them and achieve them because it may not be true what i'm rapping about but I, it'll become true because i'm putting it out into the universe and i'm listening to it and i'm kind of like training myself for that to happen we're, we're taping this right yeah okay because you, you this is this is philosophy, right? right? No, this, is, this is amazing. I mean, I'm just, the witch doctor has always been my favorite member of the Dungeon family. Yeah, Even yeah. with Andre, big boy, everybody. Same here, I, yeah. Oh, okay. That's, that's great. Um, you've kind of answered my final question. You've answered at least part of it, really, about music oh, yeah. and therapy. But, but can you say a little bit deep about your music, particularly how you talk a lot about mental illness and your some of your challenges and struggles and triumphs in your music do you think okay. about how that can be a form of well i've noticed recently that it's kind of like trendy to talk about mental health <laughs> which i have mixed feelings about but i think it's good because the conversation is happening like you have artists like logic who came out with that song where the title of the song was the suicide helpline number and that was like a huge hit reach millions of people. They said the numbers to the suicide hotline like shot up. So I can't be mad at that. Um, of course, the elephant in the room is someone like Kanye West with I hate being bipolar is awesome. And my friends were giving me so much grief because for till up about a month ago, I was like, no, nah, he's mentally ill. I love his music. He's great. But then he doubled down on the whole, he went to the White House and I was like, I mean, I'm not going to um, diagnose him, but I was reminded of what I was like when I was manic and just talking wildly. And it was kind of painful for someone who you look up to in that way, descending into this and not really, I mean, he's so famous. I don't think he has the checks and balances that a normal person like me would have. Um, so I was hoping he would take what he had been through and be more of a um, advocate for mental health, but I don't know where he's going on his journey now. I hope, he can continue to talk about mental health, but the last I heard from him, he denied he had mental illness and he's off his meds and he just believed he was dehydrated and all that. So I think he clearly needs some help. And I was getting a lot of grief from my friend circle for sticking up for him because I was like, y'all don't understand. Y'all haven't been hospitalized. Like 
you know, he's he's operating on a different level. But then he kind of doubled down on the whole uh, MAGA thing, and that was why a lot of my friends had kind of written him off. And I'm I'm not trying to get political or anything, but I I do think he's experiencing some sort of crisis that could be helped. Um, but as far as music in general, the first rapper that I'm aware of who really talked about mental illness is Scarface. And you know hip hop, you know Scarface, uh, sitting in my four cornered room with candles, you know, mind playing trick on me. Like he's been very vocal about having mental illness and depression in his music. And that's sort of like a template I can draw to um, with what I do. But just hip hop in general, um, when a song like The Message comes out, before The Message, people didn't talk in popular music. I don't know if you're familiar with Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel. The Message is- 1982. Yeah, it's, it's a very important song in the history of hip hop. But basically it was the first song in hip hop to talk about broken glass in the street, kids jumping on mattresses, like how bad the Bronx was. Because back before that, people would rap about how this glamorous life they wanted to live or Hollywood. And this was the first, like, no, this is what the real world looks like. And before I started talking about mental illness in my music, I kind of was just making songs about whatever. But my friend was like, you need to talk about what you've been through. You've been through all this stuff and not everybody's been through it. Why don't you rap about that? And it took a lot of like self-reflection and very hard to write songs about that. But the first time I did it and I put it out in the universe and my friends heard it and they were all like, whoa, this is something you have here. This is like, this is deep. So that kind of encouraged me to kind of, I, I don't want to be like pigeonholed as the, the mental illness rapper, but it, it kind of helped me pursue that truth of my narrative. Thank you for sharing this. At this point, um, I'd like to open up the floor and we have some time left if anybody has a question. Yeah. What's that? Are you on SoundCloud? Am I? SoundCloud. Yeah, I'm on SoundCloud. I'm on my website, um, givethatworm.com has stuff on it. I'm on spot. I got a couple albums on Spotify. Most of my stuff is on a website called audiomac.com. Um, I got like, I think 16 albums on there. I got some stuff on YouTube. I'm very prolific. I got some music here if anybody wants to come up afterwards. Um, but I make like an album every year and sometimes I put them out. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I put them on this platform. Sometimes I put them on that. It's, it just depends on what my mood is. I had a bunch of them on iTunes, and then I wanted people to focus on the new stuff, so I took them all down. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know how to market myself. I don't. I'm not. I'm more creative. So I just kind of put it out there, and if people hear it or they find it, they find it. Um, but I'm on a number. There's. There's not like the music industry isn't really like centralized anymore. Like when I was growing up, that is, you make a demo, you go to a record label. They put out your music, they promote you, they market you, they do the magazines and the videos and all that. Nowadays, it's just the wild, wild west pretty much. Like, there's so many people making music. I think it's great. A lot of artists hate that there's so many people making music because everybody can be a rapper now. But I think it's great that everybody can be a rapper. I think everybody should be a rapper because it's awesome. Um, <laughs> it's a good way to build a friendship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's, um, Andy Warhol said, in the future, everyone will have 15 minutes of fame. I think in the future, everyone will have a mixtape. <laughs> so um, I've got plenty of them out there. And uh, Early Bird is spelled with an E before the Y. Uh, my last name is E-A-R-L-E-Y Bird. But you just Google search or YouTube or any platform. And I probably have at least one project on it. Atmosphere? Um, I've listened to a couple of their albums. I'm not like a huge Atmosphere fan, um, but I'm aware of them and I, I respect them and they, they got a really big following and a big movement. Um, my favorite artists are like are Witch Doctor, Micah Nine, 
Um, I mean, they're all older artists. Um, there aren't as many younger ones I've connected with as much, and that's just a generation. We were talking about that last night, the generational gap in hip hop, because when you're young, you don't want to make the same music that your parents make. So of course you kind of challenge the established uh, ways that people make hip hop in the past. But um, I really like Kendrick Lamar, and I think it's amazing that he got a, a uh, Pulitzer Prize um but atmosphere is cool I, I know they just dropped an album a week or two ago um i had a friend who opened up for one of their shows um so i'm aware of most of the stuff i listen to is older cats and it's just a generational thing and now i'm in grad school i don't have time to check for a lot of the newer cats um it's worse <laughs> it is it's something you gotta keep up with when i was like 13 to like 22 like i was up on like everything if you dropped an album back then i probably heard about if i didn't listen to it i probably heard about you like i this is not centralized anymore and it's all over the place and even the underground is like it's just wide open so it's hard to kind of keep track on everybody but atmosphere is huge they got a huge following I respect them. I like a lot of their songs, and um, I think it's cool what he's doing. Oh, oh. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. All right, so uh, real big fan of hip-hop, and I definitely agree one of the main um, themes of hip-hop is the slam, this, and the litter. But I think right next to that, and in connection to the idea, is coming from nothing. And yeah. Having that underdog narrative in your music. No one wants to hear a rapper talk about I had everything. No, I still had everything. <laughs> yeah. Can you kind of describe how important it is to listen to that underdog um, messaging, even in songs that aren't necessarily clearly about that? Talk about that. Um, I think people root for the underdog. And I mean, um, even when Kanye West started out, he was the underdog because he was making music that wasn't fitting into like a gangster aesthetic. And um, I mean, if you go back to like the 90s, like Tribe Called Quest, Native Tongues were kind of making music like that. That movement kind of faded out and he kind of revitalized that whole uh, kind of quirky, off kilter type of hip hop. So um, I, I love a good underdog story. Of course, when you have someone like Kanye who then blows up and becomes famous, he's no longer the underdog and then it, it makes it a whole different world. But um, you know, I love underground rap. A lot of the artists who are like my favorite, like nobody's ever heard of them or they're like, who is that? Or they're just obscure. And you hit them up on like social media and they're like, sure, I'll do a song with you. So um, that that's a good thing. But I would like to see some of them get more um, notoriety. But um, there's so many branches of the tree of hip hop that for every group that's like a Drake or Amigos that's successful, you've got like, all these unknown ones who are just as talented or maybe even more talented and never get like the light of day. Uh, that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, Kendrick Lamar. What's your thoughts on artists like that who push out like this politicized message? Uh, for example, like since there's a lot of my uh, talking about like, institutional versus Section 80 and housing and stuff like that, what are your thoughts on like artists taking on the responsibility to push this message out? Responsibility for what? Like pushing out this message of greater than just a story or just like trying to help people out. What do you I think that's great. I commend uh, Kendrick Lamar. I think the body of work he's built is very powerful. I mean, um, he won a Pulitzer Prize. I, I, I never would have thought any rapper would win a Pulitzer Prize. And then you listen to his album, and it's kind of like um, I tell this story about Biggie. Um, I was coming back from New York one night and I had Biggie Smalls first album. I had Jay-Z's first album. And the first one I listened to was Jay-Z's first album. And it was really cool. I was vibing to it. It was really cool. Late at night driving home. I was like, this is a good album. Then I put Biggie's in. I got about halfway through Biggie's album. I had to turn it off because it was so emotional and so raw and so powerful that you feel like you're in his psyche and you're like, man, this is troublesome. This is like powerful, the stuff he's talking about. And I feel that way about some of the stuff Kendrick Lamar raps about. It's very, you know, he talks about like police brutality, he talks about 
being black in America. And I don't know what it's like to be black in America, but I listen to his music and it, it's like he's an ambassador who can give me a, a view into his world. And um, for him to be able to do that with the power of music, I think is a fantastic thing. And uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, do you think other artists should take on the responsibility? Um, I don't think every artist needs to necessarily be politically active or social. Sometimes you just want to turn up in the club and drink or go to a strip club or something. There's, there's an avenue for that type of music too. And I, I was talking about this with Kwame last night. Rap in itself is a political act. It doesn't necessarily need to be about politics to be political, especially if you're a black man in America and you're voicing your opinion, that in itself is a political act, regardless of whether it's over a beat or not. So for people to say, oh, these rappers aren't political enough, like you don't like um, an example I use is two chains. When I first heard two chains, I thought he was funny, but I didn't think there was much to his story. Then I watched a documentary about him and I heard about where he grew up and what he escaped and all the hurdles he had to overcome. And then I understood how that sense of humor was sort of something that propelled him into this greatness where he's this huge artist now and he's selling out arenas and he's platinum and he's on all these songs. And, and I just like smiled when I heard that story because it was just an amazing underdog story. Somebody who started from the bottom, from nothing and overcame. And um, the music may be silly or may be funny, but not everything has to be political or public enemy or um, like, I think just rapping in itself is a political act. I was talking to my friend who's a rapper and he's black. And he says, people see me and they expect me to be a rapper. They expect me to be able to rap or freestyle. I don't know if you've seen the movie, Sorry to Bother You. There's a scene about that in that movie um, where there's a black guy at a party and they're like a bunch of white people around him. They're like, oh, rap for us. And he's like, I don't know how to rap. And they like egg him on and get him to rap. But um, my friend said, they expect that out of me. When I rap as a white man, it's not expected. So it's a little different. Um, it's a different context to operate in because I'm not getting racially profiled by the police. I'm not experiencing um, post-traumatic stress from some of these circumstances that people that are commonplace in like the black community, but I'm aware of them and I try to stay abreast of them because um, I think it's important as somebody who participates in this culture to be aware of them and knowledgeable of where the music comes from and where it's going when you participate in it. I didn't okay. hear that. Okay, it sounds like you've had a lot of training or discussions with different police groups. And as a training with police? Different police groups. Yeah. What's the reaction been from the police? Yeah, like, are they taking their Um, I well, I just was at the conference across the street, and I told, I gave a speech, and then the speech, they all stood up and started clapping. I had them come up after me, um, after me at the speech, and talking to me and um, sharing their stories and giving me pointers and telling them how things I told were pointers to them. Um, the the crux of the speech I gave was that people paint people with mental illness with a broad brush, but people also paint police with a broad brush. So I was talking about what it was like to be mentally ill and the things that you go through. And then I pivoted and I started talking about what it is like to be a police officer, what police officers deal with, things that the public doesn't know about police officers that they face and, and the pressures of that sort of duty and then I sort of tied together that um, we have more in common than we do different. And we need to work together to find solutions in the community to policing and how we um, deal with or apprehend people who have mental illness. That answer your question?
All right, well, I have uh, music for sale. I have my dad's book for sale. We're selling the book for the same price you can get it on Amazon. We're not making a profit off it. It's uh, $16. I have music. Come talk to me. I can work out something if you want to buy some music. If you have a CD player, I have um, <laughs> cassettes. I also have drop cards for people who don't have CD players. If you want to download something. So thank you very much. Thank and you. have a good day.